Uh, with Mandate of Heaven, we chose to go back uh, to the start of the Yellow Turban Rebellion because in the Rise of the Warlords campaign, we kind of join at the end of the rebellion. Uh, they're still the sort of main antagonist um, for many of the factions at the beginning, gives them something to sort of get strong by defeating. Um, but at that point, it's actually just the, the remnant. The main game starts in essentially in media res. All these characters that you see are established, like Tao Tao Lobe, even Dong Zhou, the tyrant himself. Um, so by stepping back and taking a look at this, like the origin stories, we start to understand who these people were, how they came to be, and the dramatic events that led them to uh, to take their place at the beginning of our, our main game. Lo Bei, Cao Cao, Sun Jian, even Dong Zhuo are all these characters who are established. Uh, and one big event has just ended, but there are other events that we haven't seen that we don't understand that, that could really help sort of contextualize these characters and help us learn a bit more about them. It's a very hard time for the people. Uh, lots of natural disaster, floods, famines, earthquakes. They saw it as a sign that the government had failed. You know, corruption had gotten out of hand, and uh, the Zhang brothers, that's Zhang Zhe, Zhang Liang, and Zhang Bao, um, sort of resolved to, to basically overthrow what they perceived to be a, you know, an utterly corrupt uh, government and put something a bit more for the people in place. So who are my favourite characters and standout characters in the Mandate campaign? Well, one of our new characters, Prince Lu Chong, is definitely a highlight, and I think most people will agree with that when they play him. The sixth and final Prince of Chen, I believe. Um, he was a member of the royal family who sort of was a bit disillusioned with how things were going and decided to return to his, um, his fiefdom, uh, which is Chen, and establish sort of a sanctuary. Um, as the Yellow Turban Rebellion was going on, he had a considerable fighting force, mainly of archers, um, which he used to defend the territory and uh, look after the people there. So you see in him a man torn between his dynasty and his loyalty to his family, the ruling dynasty of China, uh, and his own holdings and how he sort of navigates that, as well as him just being a really cool, bombastic uh, warrior. Sadly, on account of not wanting to really help the warlords who are looking out for themselves, um, so Yuan Shu took offense at this and actually dispatched someone to assassinate him. So we have Yuan Shu to blame for someone who might have ultimately been maybe the best option uh, in terms of successes to the Han Dynasty. Seeing Dong Zhuo a little younger and a little more uh, a little more unformed is one of our most standout moments. It's, he wasn't always the terrible tyrant and big bad guy that you see him in the main game uh, and you see what leads him to be like that. At one point he was a loyal general of the Han and then as he starts to see the corruption sort of taking it over he starts to shift himself in a lot of ways, he's quite prescient and like can see what's going wrong, but it's just he goes about it in the wrong way, or maybe you won't. So another interesting character we have is Lu Jin, uh, who among other things is famous for having been the tutor of Liu Bei and Gong Xinzan. So when you play the Rise of the Warlords campaign in 190, you'll see that uh, Gong Xinzan and Liu Bei have a relationship already. You know, they're friends. They you know, they have history, and that's because in their youth, uh, they were both learning under this character Lu Jin, uh, who himself was a general and a great fighter and a statesman as well. So the origin stories for the, the big characters in Mandate are quite interesting because, again, it's like you can see them from their very humble beginnings to the very end when it becomes the Three Kingdoms itself, sort of this timeline from rags to riches, like in Liu Bei's situation where he, like he literally starts his campaign with nothing and has to march himself around to to gain some prestige and some success. Uh, there's Cao Cao, who is, well, he's been in the government for a while. He's served as a captain, and uh, at the start of the Yellow Turban Rebellion, he's called uh, to, to be a general and to actually serve in the military. Um, and he does that in the wake of having been frustrated by attempts to fight corruption in the government. So he sees this maybe as a, a chance to sort of prove himself and, and do like his own thing in the name of you know restoring the, the, the status quo. Uh, and Sun Jian, who has been fighting pirates uh, and petty lords around his hometown uh, is looking to make a name for himself and to defend the dynasty as well. And early in this period, he ends up, I think, storming the gates of, storming the walls of a town called Wan, chasing the yellow turbans back and you know, his entire force follows him afterwards. And a real real sense that he's gonna have this, this power, this brashness, this bravery that um, sort of personifies him in the main game. And unlike the beginning of the main game, where we have an established power base for these three characters, we're going to see how these these players, these main players in the Three Kingdoms saga, sort of scrabble their way into a position of power. And we'll see whether they succeed or whether they fade into obscurity. 